where do you start yeah. a biography? Yeah. Yes. I mean, the classic Tristram Shandy thing, at what point does a man's yes. life start? That's right. Does, does it start with the grand, grandparents and, yes, um, you right. know, and, and, and you follow the genetic line that's of their right. inheritance? It, it, I mean, there's lots of ways of skinning a cat. Um, I mean, David Noakes did an extraordinary biography of Jane Austen, which begins way back in the, in the 18th century with great-grandparents and, and, you know, and people going to India. What on earth has this got to do with a Jane Austen biography? But of course, I mean, there's no right answer. I think that was an, over, an overestimate of how much the reader would take of background before you get to foreground. The other way, of course, is start off like Peter Ackroyd and Dickens. Dickens was dead. And you plunge deep into the narrative at some point and then go back and tell all the things that happened up to that point. Yeah. But there's no right way to start. You try innumerable ways. So in the exhibition, uh, one of the uh, working papers we have towards the Penguin biography uh, is an early draft, a page from an early draft of, uh, of the biography, and it's annotated by Mark Kincaid Weeks. And I know that this was a particular kind of crux that you had in the biography, an yes. interpretive crux. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. Yes, I mean, um, down in Cornwall in 1917, um, a friend of a friend um, called Esther Andrews came down and in fact stayed at the cottage some, some, some weeks. And later in life, um, apparently, Frieda said that Lawrence had had an affair with her. But when you look into it, in fact, this is a, a misunderstanding from Mabel Dodge Luhan, who'd heard Frieda talking about Lawrence being unfaithful to her, and got the wrong woman, unfortunately. So Esther Andrews, there was... Anyway, in the biography that I was writing at this stage, I hadn't got this sorted out. I still thought there might have been some relationship between Lawrence and Esther Andrews. Mark, who knew much more about her than I did, because he'd, after all, done the middle volume of the Cambridge book, um, and he was really sure that I was getting this wrong. And so his comments on, on this page I'm looking at, in pencil in the margins, you know, are very, um, they're very tactful. They're not saying, you've really messed this up, John, uh, but they are, you know, trying to elucidate from what I've got here what is perhaps true, what is partly true, uh, and, and what is not. And I think he was extraordinarily good at this, because a result of this, and then a, a long conversation after it, I, I changed this paragraph completely. And if you look at the Penguin biography itself, yeah. it's a different page. The other kind of change that's remarkable, of course, is the later stage, when the, uh, the, the publisher uh, wants an editor to go through your work and look at the details. Yeah. And in this case, I was both very lucky um, and in some ways rather chastened by my Penguin editor, because she, uh, scribbled all over my book um, in some ways that were very, very helpful. In other ways, I found extremely annoying. And so, uh, being myself annoyed with what she'd done, I then scribbled in the margins myself, things like, tut, tut, <laughs> commenting on her comments on, on my writing. Um, and this was rather childish of me, I think, but it still it, it helped me get past this stage. I was, as it were, thinking, well, how much of her work, how much should I incorporate? She's very good at counting the number of times I use the word significantly, for example. For something like, third time. And she's right there, of course. I shouldn't be using the word over and over and again like that. That's just silly of me. And she's doing all the things a publisher and editor should do. But when it comes to saying that I'm underrating Frida Lawrence, for example, which she did a great deal of, um, I didn't think she was right at all. And those bits I didn't change. I think I'm correct in saying, John, that um you didn't get the title that you wanted. You're right. For the Penguin biography. <laughs> exactly right. I was rung up one awful day, one Wednesday, and told that they were making a decision that afternoon and the title had to change. And this deeply annoyed me. I was offered three titles, and I had to choose one of them. And if I didn't, they'd choose it for me. Um, the one I wanted, I still believe in as the right title to the book, was D.H. Lawrence, The Life of a Writer. Now, that wasn't sexy enough for Penguin books. And for me, it was a, a good title. And although you get a writer's life quite commonly in biographers, you'd never get the life of a writer. There's never been one like that. And anyway, I was told it had to be either uh, Lawrence's the life of an outsider or Lawrence's the life of a, of a radical, which, of course, is a stupid thing to say because he wasn't politically involved in that kind of way. And I forget the third one about the prophet of love, I think, something, something stupid. So all I could do was say, OK, do the outsider one. And then they did allow me to go back to the book and make some modifications to the book to fit the title which had been imposed upon me. But I would much rather not have done that. As it is, the book does, as it were, reflect its title occasionally, because that is work after the event. In terms of writing that single life of Lawrence, you, you talked about the process of selecting 
um, material for that, creating a narrative of Lawrence's life. How comfortable are you with creating a single narrative? In a way, however many stranded that narrative is, it, it still needs, in a sense, to have the consistency that a book has with covers <laughs> either side of it. Yes, it does. How comfortable are you as a biographer producing that and not doing what Edward Nels did, yes. edging his bets and just giving you yes. numerous voices? At like. one sense, I feel ashamed because I didn't do what Edward Nels did. On the other hand, of course, um, as a good old fashioned academic, I feel, of course, there is no such thing as a single grand narrative. We all do that. Back in the 80s, we got rid of that one, hadn't we? And what am I doing as a biographer? Creating grand narratives. On the other hand, um, I discovered while becoming a biographer, because you don't sort of born one, you become one, that I actually very much liked telling stories. I didn't know this about myself. I'd never done it before. I didn't have children to tell stories to when they were young. I came to tell stories when I was older. Um, I thought that's a that help, that helps very much. But as a narrator, I find myself compelled to tell the story of, as it were, you're building a bridge out like that, and you've got to get to the other side. You know, and how you get there, there are numerous ways, you see, numerous strands. Um, and there's no one that's right. But you as one, you think, instinct, experience, it helps you understand. That will produce more of the good stuff and less of the entirely personal point of view than other ways of doing it. And so you can never do the perfect biography of all the details in all the places. Um, and you can never do the, 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 the ideal biography, which is somehow so multi-level and multilingual and multi-personality that you know, it, it would survive any examination in any circumstances. It sounds a monster that put like that. Um, no, what I want to do now, particularly, and like a Wordsworth book at the moment, is write a single narrative, but one that is faithful to at least all that I know and feel about the author I'm writing about and the works of that author as well. I must never say things that aren't consistent with what the writer is themselves writing. That's, that's, that's the one forbidden thing as a biographer of a literature person. Or, or one is an important thing about the biography of a literary figure. You've got to be in touch with the work and not say things about their life which are, aren't in some ways consistent with the personality which is inevitably revealed in, in the work.